it's quite likely that I had the same blood as you. It's quite likely I had Viking blood. <laughs> because in 793 is the first recorded time when the Norsemen came and went on their holidays, their expeditions to Lindisfarne, not far from Newcastle on Tyne. So I'm claiming 8th century Viking blood in my veins <laughs> from some sort of um, interactions with the Anglo-Saxons and the Norse. Anyway, you can accept that or not. I don't really know the answer to that. I, I, I run, uh, I'm the director of the Australian Institute of Health Innovation. That's a, a large group looking at patient safety, e-health, uh, transitional care, medication safety, all the things that I know you are thinking about, working on, doing studies on, or whatever. So we have this mission in my institute. There's about 100 of us. 70 researchers, 30 PhD students, four professors, each running a centre within an institute, within a faculty of medicine, within a large Australian university in Sydney. And we do, we try to provide evidence to improve the health system. So we do studies and we try and think theoretically about the health system, much the same as the sort of work, we could map many of our studies and much of our work to the work that you're interested in and you do. So we have four research centres if you want a lesson in career management, do not use me as an example. I'm a very bad example. I forgot to duck. So I became both the director of this institute and I run one of the centres, the Centre for Clinical Governance Research, which is uh, to do with quality and safety. That's a bad career move. So don't follow me in looking for inspiration for your career. This is crazy. So I, I, I got the job of being the director of the institute, unfortunately, um, and I also try to do sort of all that administrative stuff. Also, um, Enrico Kouira is a colleague of mine. Enrico Kouira is an e-health researcher. You may know that name, and if not, he's worth Googling. And he does very interesting work in um, e-health, uh, especially the safety of e-health, which Richard, of course, has written a famous dissenting report on, which was not, not uncontroversial. And it's a very interesting report, that it's a short report, well worth looking at. Ken Hillman is an intensivist. Uh, so Enrico is a doctor who saw that uh, computers and informatics was more interesting than doing medicine. Ken Hillman is an intensivist and an intensive care specialist. He looks at medical emergency, and we all look at work together, of course, but he specifically looks at work on medical emergency teams, deteriorating patients, and death and dying. Ken's an interesting guy. Ken's one of the few people I've ever met who has said, you should give me less funding. Have you ever heard anyone say that to you in healthcare? <laughs> this is remarkable. He said, you should, I run intensive care units. You should give me less funding. What do you think he's getting at, by the way? We should have less funding for intensive care and more funding for palliative care. More funding for palliative care. A third of Ken Hillman's patients die in intensive care no intensivist wants to die that way. And yet a third of the patients admitted to his intensive care unit die in that intensive care unit. That's not an attractive way to die. Mind you, I'm hoping, Richard, not to have any attractive way to die for some time to come. I don't know about you. Joanna Westbrook is the fourth professor and runs another, the fourth of the research centres. She's an epidemiologist and she looks at safe systems of work in the health system, especially interested in medication safety and does big studies in medication safety. I say all that not because, uh, not because uh, I want to pro pro uh, pro prolong the talk and uh, talk about these people, but if your work maps to any of these people, I can, pick, I can put you in touch so that we can build connections between Swedish researchers on the Swedish health system and Australian researchers on the Australian health system because we're doing very similar work. Okay. And then my own centre looks at clinical governance. It's a strange title. It really comes from the NHS. And my very good friend is um, Sir Liam Donaldson, who used to be the chief medical officer in the UK, in the English NHS. Now, isn't he? He's a professor of health policy at uh, Imperial College London. And he was the one who was having a bath and one day said, we need clinical governance. These ideas came to his head. <laughs> so fame and fortune beckon if you can think of a smart new idea. But don't try and think of it as Lee in healthcare, it's already been thought of, okay? Mm -hmm. So you need your own sort of new idea. Um, so who's been to Sydney? 
and everyone else wants to go to Sydney, don't you? You know why you want to go to Sydney? It's got people like me, that's fantastic, but it's really nice, and you can't see this very well. However, it's a lovely place, and you know what it's got? No snow, no ice, very little rain, it's always in drought, but fantastic weather. It's like this every day I wake up. Well, almost, almost, almost. And lovely beaches as well. So you must come, and if you do come, let me know. We'll have you to our institute, and we'll have some coffee and we'll take you to lunch. <laughs> if you drop in. Yeah. <laughs> it's 24 hours to get there. Yeah. Uh, so here's, a, just for completeness, you, you're right, I did, I did make a copy, of, I will make a copy of the slides available, and I've got lots of slides I won't talk to, but I've made a complete set so that you can have a look at them later. And here's some comparisons of Australia and Sweden. 23 million now, Australia? 10 million, Sweden? These figures are a couple of years old. Uh, population growth, we still have population growth. We're, we're, we're not, unlike some European populations where the, the, the population is aged, uh, our population is aging, but we're still a relatively young country, only 240 years old. Um, uh, and uh, we still have uh, net migration. Uh, and um, area, we're absolutely massive country. Uh, the, the, the distance from Perth, one end of the country, to, to Sydney, is the same distance as from London to Moscow. It's that sort of distance that we're talking about when we talk about flying across Australia. So I fly over all of that to come here to Sweden. Um, GDP per capita, we're both rich countries. Uh, we've got um, more GDP per capita. Uh, we've got lots and lots of resources that are being sold, like you have lots of resources being sold to China and India. And we're in the epicenter of growth uh, right next to Southeast Asia. So it's very, very good for Australia. Australia has been called the lucky country economically. And, you know, we do imports and exports. We're very much a trading nation, uh, as, as, as is we. So um, enough of that. Let's talk about safety. We got recently a, a $10.8 million grant from the National Health and Medical Research Council to do patient safety and implementation science research. That's the biggest grant you could ever hope for if you're in our business. And um, that's now $10 million Australian. It's about $10 million U.S., 10.7 million US. So that's, you know, what's that in Swedish currency? Uh, 65, 70 million. Yeah. A sizable grant, okay? And people like us hardly ever got research grants of that size. Mostly it was the people splicing genes and doing molecular biology and other people at the Karolinska kind of places. So we've got this large grant. And this was the opening sentence. After decades of improving the healthcare system, patients still receive care that's highly variable, frequently inappropriate, and too often unsafe. No one who's in our business would disagree, I think, with that statement. And so that started off a grant that earned us 10.85 million Australian, same as US dollars. And, and the argument is we have not made inroads into this thing that probably worldwide we've spent not just hundreds of millions of dollars, but probably billions of dollars on patient safety and quality of care. And yet, at the systems level. There's no study that shows, say, if the rate of harm is 10%, if 10% if of all admissions to acute care uh, has, uh, is associated with some sort of harm or hydrogenic, uh, 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 hydrogenic uh, harm or, 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 or an adverse event or whatever you want to call it. There's no study that shows at the systems level that's gone down after all this effort to say 8%. In fact, some studies which suggest that the rate of harm is higher than that. So this is a complex adaptive system resistant to our efforts to make improvements. So we have to do things differently. We have to do things differently. No sane person, Einstein said, would keep on doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That would be insane, said Einstein. So I think Einstein might, might be right. So we opened with that and said, what we really have to do is do some different things. And we've been doing safe, trying to do safety two and implementation science, et cetera. But at the moment, safety two is more a theory than an actual set of demonstrable studies. And I think that's where we are. That's the, that's the crossroads that we're at. So let me talk a little bit further about that, if I may. So let me just scale this back a little bit. The question I often ask to people is, how do organizations work? In fact, there's an even more basic question. I'm talking about healthcare organizations. There's an even more basic question, which is, what's your definition of a healthcare organization? 
What, what is it fundamentally that is a healthcare organization? Do you want to have a throw around that idea with me? This is a bit of sort of philosophy theory. What's a healthcare organization? What healthcare organizations do? Provide healthcare. <laughs> they do, yeah, it's a tautology, isn't it? Yeah, they deliver care. Okay, let me tell you what my, and, you, and we could sort of say, okay, well, there's wards, units, and departments, and they have a hierarchy, and we could do all sorts of descriptive work to describe a healthcare organization. Let me tell you my definition of a healthcare organization. A healthcare organization is what's left over when all the easy stuff's been done already. <laughs> okay, a health, now just let's play with that for a second. A healthcare organization, it's, what, it's what's left over after all the easy things have been fixed, including any kind of organization like this one. So the job of people working in that organization is to fix or work on wicked problems. Problems that are not definitionally easy to fix or even possible to fix. If by fix we mean we're going to just sort it all out and everything's going to be beautiful. And there's going to be violin music playing in the background. That's not going to happen, is it? Because this is a wicked problem or a wicked set of problems we're working on to try and resolve patient care which is incredibly complex, has incredible numbers of variables operating, and is almost something that unfolds emergently without anybody doing anything, without managers or policymakers or politicians or whoever. Uh, sort of behavior just keeps on being emergent, just keeps on happening. I once talked to a health minister who's now the prime minister in Australia, Tony Abbott chatted to him. We are both on the way to an aeroplane in an airport. He was the health minister. And you know what he said to me? Healthcare. It's just being a health minister, it's just one damn thing after another. <laughs> one damn thing after another. That's what he said to me. He's now the prime minister. <laughs> How do organizations work? They are incredibly complex. They've got multiple competing variables and interests. The doctors want to go this way, the nurses another way. Uh, patients would like another sort of set of interests being mobilized. You can deal with this very politically, but then what is left over after all the easy stuff is being fixed? Because humans are ingenious and will fix all the things they can. And what's left over is what we're left with. That's why your research is so complex. That's why the manager's job is so hard. That's why the clinicians get so frustrated. So. That's an interesting definition, isn't it? Not one, perhaps, that you've heard. OK. But most people don't have our sophisticated view of healthcare. They think healthcare works like this. There's a CEO who's all powerful and knows what's going on and moves the chess pieces around. There's cascading stuff. So if this person sends some policy out, it's taken up by these people. And many people have this instrumental, normative, hierarchical view of the way the system works. Can I disappoint them? No, it doesn't. Healthcare, oh, sorry, before I say that. So this is how you deal with error if you have this view, because that's a linear view. You think cause and effect. I do this, this will happen. Cause and effect. So you'll start to get a, a belief in reason Swiss cheese, or if I do this, things will go like this, or there is a root cause that I have to find and that will be the actual answer to patient safety questions. And then all we have to do is let this never happen again. Excuse me? <laughs> so you get all sorts of stories in the literature in safety one mode of, you know, let's go through the Swiss cheese and there's medication of just for completeness in the slides. I've given you a medication error story in this linear frame. However, healthcare is not like that organization <laughs> chart. It's like that. Healthcare is like that. It's a complex adaptive system with all sorts of behavioral loops and swirls. So this is a representation. By the way, this is not a representation of the whole health system. This is only an emergency department. Try and represent the entire health system through systems dynamics kind of software, and you'd run out of paper. Or digital screen. OK? So that's the sort of nature of the problem we're having to face. And what we've done is applied linear thinking, safety one type thinking, to this problem. And we've gotten as far as we can and no further. And that's the cusp for me, the inherent dilemma that we are actually in. And that's the problem. We, 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 we have this level of challenge. Hey, this is not all bad news. Can I just let you into a secret? We're not running out of work anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that cheers you up or not. <laughs> but 
the challenges we are facing are not going to be dissolved or solved uh, by some magic wand. Unfortunately, many people across the world still think that's the case. That we're going to just, you know, have the next lean or restructure or whatever it might be, and that will, a new policy that will sort it out. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Because health organizations are what's left over when all the easy stuff's been fixed and they're complex adaptive <laughs> systems. Okay? Now, we've done a number of studies looking at this, and I really like the sort of studies that are done when you use social network analysis. <clears throat> social network analysis. So we do a lot of this. What we're trying to do is understand not the organization, the way it works in the organization chart, with the boxes on the chart and the cascading sort of uh, hierarchies and the ward units and departments. What I'm interested in is actual behavior on the ground. And so we use social network analysis. Now, here's a modest study we did. Somebody's PhD, um, Nerida Kreswitz's PhD. You can't see it very well because... It's too sunny here in uh, Sweden. You can't, you can't see it very well. But actually what it shows is, here's all the people in an emergency department, 105 people. And we asked them all, who would you go to if you had a problem? All 105 people in an emergency department. Everybody in the emergency department roster. There's a published paper, 2009, BMC Health Services Research. I'll send you a copy if you have any trouble getting it. So quite a modest study. Now, who would people go to? They'd actually go to quite a number of people on the roster. What you can't see very well is, um, we coloured the different professions a different colour. So on the, on the, uh, on the, on the um, social network analysis, the circles of people and the, uh, and the lines are if you would go to that person if you had a problem. So you produce a dense network map like this. It's a network of the emergency department. And you can't see it very well. But what we did was we coloured the doctors blue, sorry, the nurses blue, the doctors red, the allied health staff, physios, pharmacists, etc., yellow, and the admin and support people green. And what you can't see very well on this, uh, uh, on this, but you will be when you get the slides, is who would people go to if they had a problem? Somebody like them. Somebody in their profession. In other words, anthropologically speaking, people are tribal. Who do you go to? Who do you hang out with? If you have a problem, you hang out with somebody in your tribe. Doctors with doctors, nurses with nurses, etc. So then we ask them, who would you go to if you had a medication problem? The network diagram changes a bit, but the colors still stick together. Now, we know this in social network analysis. It's called homophily. Do you know that word? Homophily? We know that word because your mother said it. Your mother said, watch out, little Maria. Birds of a feather flock together. Have you heard that statement? Have you heard that phrase? Birds of a feather flock together. Maybe it doesn't translate very well in Swedish. I'm seeing some puzzles. <laughs> Homophily means people of the same kind will stick together. I don't know if you've ever been, those of you who've been to Australia, to an Australian barbecue. We're famous for having a barbecue. And what you find is all the blokes are over here <laughs> drinking beer and all the women are over there having a chat. Birds of a feather flock together, homophily. And it happens in healthcare. So all the blue people would go to other blue people, other nurses if they had a medication problem, and so on and so forth. Then we asked them what I think was the genius question. We said, who do you socialize with? It's a less dense social network. In other words, you might work with them, but you don't have to go to tea with them or go to lunch with them. However, who do you socialize with? Nurses with nurses. Doctors with doctors, allied health with allied health, and admin and support with admin and support. In other words, when you look at the health system, people are tribal anthropologically down to their bootstraps. They've trained with these people, they trust these people, they are tribal. Now, in healthcare, you've written papers and we've written papers saying we must have more multidisciplinary teamwork. Well, on the strength of this, that is not easy, and you're not going to just wave a magic wand and have multidisciplinary teamwork. Because people are inherently tribal, even without thinking about it. So there's a modest study we did which illuminates some of the features of behavior on the ground in healthcare. So, we are captured by linear thinking. We have some anthropological features of healthcare which makes it very interesting. We're stuck with all these wicked problems, 
and we have real difficulty making the progress that we need to make. That's the story so far. So for the reasons I've given in this first part of the talk, we need new ways of thinking. Now, some would say that resilient healthcare is a new way of thinking. Someone like Richard and Eric Holnagel and Bob Weirs and some other people <laughs> would say, we've been thinking these thoughts for a long time. Me too. I have been arguing against, for example, for 20 years, doing studies and arguing against people, doing top-down change and restructuring without taking into account what's happening at the clinical coalface. But I never used the word resilient healthcare to try and sustain that argument until I met these guys. But we've been working in parallel, a number of us across the world, trying to put this message through that just trying to cascade down top-down change or reorganize or have linear thinking as part of our uh, armamentarianism, as part of our strategy, isn't going to get us anywhere. And we've been arguing that for many years. So, we need new thinking beyond this linear thing that we're trained to think. When you trained at school, at university, as a clinician, a lot of the thinking was linear. If you do this, this will happen. If you get a di diagnosis and then treat someone like this, you will get this result. However, even though we're trained in it, and even though cognitively that's the way the brain works, it is not serving us well in this particular instance. In this particular instance. So we've done some work on looking at healthcare as a complex adaptive system, and then the Resilient Healthcare book, I know, I know Richard has for many years, in the Resilient Healthcare book, we've looked at the features of complex adaptive systems within which all these behaviors are embedded that we are trying to change or improve. Uh, here's my list um, from, uh, I think it's the Resilient Healthcare book, the last one, and we've got another one in, in, in train, the next, next one in the series, which I'm helping to edit. I'm help, helping or, Eric, Eric Holnagel and Bob, Bob uh, Weirs to edit. So complex adaptive systems have agents that have some level of autonomy. In healthcare, there's deep levels of autonomy, especially among, amongst one group. They are interrelating. Relationships are rich. There's non-linearity. People don't just say, oh, I'll do this and you do that and then we're, this will happen. There's all sorts of loops and worlds, as shown on that earlier slide. They're self-organizing. If you took all, here's, here's some heresy. If you took all the managers and policy makers out of the equation and sent them all on a month's leave, the health system would still work. They'd still be care delivered. <laughs> By the way, when I say to policymakers and managers that at big conferences, what do you think the reaction is? But it's true. If you took out both those layers. It happens every summer. Right? It happens every summer. Yeah. <laughs> they go on vacation. Mm. It's self-organizing. It's hierarchical. It's path dependent. Now, this is sort of complex adaptive system kind of talk. But where you came from matters. Historically, where you came from in the health system, it matters. It will determine some of the things that happen today. Behaviours are emergent. Remember that health minister who became the prime minister, Tony Abbott, who said, it's one damn thing after another. From a health minister's point of view, there's always stuff happening. Well, from everybody's point of view, there's always stuff happening. Feedback occurs, but it doesn't occur in a net, nice, neat way. Sometimes you're walking along the corridor in a hospital, and you suddenly say, aha, I've just realised something. Where does that knowledge come from? Where does that knowledge come from? Feedback occurs. Or you meet somebody in a corridor, have a quick chat to them, and now the world looks differently. Uh, so feedback occurs, but not just formal feedback systems in different ways, not just, um, uh, you know, I information management systems. It's fractal and nested. Behaviours that happen in one part actually sometimes really are emblematic of behaviour that occurs in another part at another level in the system. It's fractal and, beha and behaviours are nested. It's heterarchical. Do you know that word? Heterarchy? Not only is a health system hierarchical, it's got layers like that, but it's hierarchical. It's got silos like that. We call them formally wards, units, and departments in the acute sector. But also, there's all sorts of heterarchies, hierarchical structures that are built on friendships and networks that aren't following the formal system. And they're really what makes healthcare work. They're really what makes healthcare work. Little groups, there's other words, microsystems, for example, little groups that make healthcare work by delivering care. Individuals don't know the whole system, and yet the whole system somehow works at some level. 
So you might be working in one part of the system, doing your job, you don't know what's happening in the rest, but nevertheless you're part of a bigger enterprise. And you don't necessarily know, nor could you know, all the things that are happening. You usually only know your local element, your local considerations. So there's some uh, properties, characteristics of healthcare. Richard's famous paper, by the way, the famous How Complex Systems Fail, which I carry a copy around with me, not just for the purpose of this. <laughs> carry around a copy on my computer and often in paper. Uh, it's very interesting because it says how complex systems fail, and he gives 18 different characteristics of healthcare in terms of their complexity. When I read this, I wasn't so interested in why health, why complex systems fail. I was interested in his views on complexity, and they can be mapped to many of the ones that I gave in my earlier, in my earlier slide. So I just put these also to remind you in the slides for completeness, but they are very useful to think about where you're working in the health system and whether you take these into account. And we maybe get done. But we can summarize those, that level of complexity in a different way. And here's Eric Holdenable, 2012. He sort of uh, said, let's distinguish between safety one and safety two thinking. Safety one, a focus on when things go wrong. Trying to reduce error to stamp out error. Reduce that 10% harm, if it's 10%, to some lower level. In wards, units and departments, in hospitals, in other uh, health settings, in other healthcare organisations, and across entire health systems. Let's ameliorate, reduce harm. But there's another way, isn't there? I know a way that we've come to understand which is safety too. Of course, the healthcare produces harm, but what about when things go right? What do we know about that? Not much. We've theorized about it in resilient healthcare circles, in resilient en engineering, but we don't do very many studies. In fact, if you look at the NHS, which everyone does, of course, in England, and you look at what they've done, they have inquiry after inquiry when things go wrong. They've put all their investment into root cause analysis, uh, trying to issue more policy, trying to uh, force the system to produce less errors, fewer errors, and fewer errors are not being produced. Incident information management systems, all sorts of things. And I've done research in that area, my group has, and done a lot of research in that area, study after study. But we haven't paused and said, what do we know about the properties of a complex adaptive system when things go right. What do we know when we don't deliver harm? So my slide on that, and I've got you know, lots of other things, my slide on that across here says, if harm is being produced when things go wrong 10% of the time, and we've had inquiries and incident monitoring and RCAs and hand hygiene, handover, checklists, etc., 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 working on this, what we've done is we've omitted to work on this, the 90% when things go right. Now, did I say Einstein said don't keep doing the same thing time and again because that's insane? It's insane that we've just looked at this when we should be looking at what are the properties, what are the constituent elements, what are the characteristics that go to make up things going right. Now, let's just think about that just for a little while. Say we were a bunch of clinicians and we all worked together. We didn't always see eye to eye. Sometimes we had a toxic culture. Sometimes we even hated each other. Sometimes we liked each other because we're Swedish, let's say. <laughs> and yesterday and the day before 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 we cared for our patients and didn't produce an error. And the reason we did that was we adjusted our behavior. It's in the 90%. We adjusted our behaviors. We organized somehow so we caught some near misses but they never got known because it just was done. We organized so that even with a toxic environment, not enough resources or whatever the characteristics of the healthcare system that we worked in, we sometimes, so we somehow conspired to make things go right. And then tomorrow we come to work and there's an error. What's the, what's the nature of that error? Is it actually an error? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Is it actually an error? Does it make sense to call that an error? When sometimes, Things will go wrong, inevitably, in a complex adaptive system. 
And who's, who's studied and who's worked out how come in that toxic environment with not enough resources and a bit of trouble amongst us and sometimes when we didn't feel well, we conspired to produce good care all those times? Have we ever studied that? Or have we studied that much? Do we really understand that? The answer is not much. Not nearly as much as all of the effort we've put into this, which probably amounts to billions of US dollars across the world. Billions of US dollars. So that's interesting. Now, something else happened on the weekend. <laughs> Richard took me here. So why did Master sink on 10th of August 1628? I went to the website and had a look after we'd visited. This is what it says. The news of the sinking reached the Swedish king, who was in Prussia. It's good to be the king, isn't it? <laughs> After two weeks, they didn't have internet. The disaster had to be the result of, the king said, foolishness and incompetence, and the guilty must be punished. He wrote to the Royal Commission in Stockholm. The king, in the 17th century, was stuck in safety wine, wasn't he? <laughs> he didn't know much. What exactly lay behind the loss could not be determined with certainty in the inquest held in the palace, but the ship's lack of stability, it was actually centre of gravity stuff, wasn't it? Was a, fact, was a factor. The, uh, the underwater part of the hull was too small and the ballast insufficient in relation to the rig and the cannon. The leaders of the inquest believed that the ship was well built, but incorrectly proportioned. <laughs> Sound like they were defending their position a bit, if you ask me. And then finally... After Vasa, many successful ships with two or even three gun decks were built, so something must have been learned from the disaster. That's from the website. <laughs> so they were in safety one. A disaster occurred, and disasters aren't catastrophes, and errors aren't always bad. They probably are to the local circumstances and the person they happen to. But if we learn from them, and we moreover learn about adjusting and things going right, we stand to benefit. And that's exactly where we are in our work, I submit to you. So, OK, I've got lots of other models, critical analysis of safety one. You've heard many of these before. And if you haven't, I'm sure Richard can uh, provide us. <laughs> they know it all. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and um, therefore not a different perspective. Safety two, um, when things go right, the 90% versus the 10%. You know, what I'm hoping is this slide. What I'm hoping in a few years' time, people like Don Berwick at IHI or whoever it is, might say, you know, what on earth were we thinking? To put all our eggs in the safety one basket. To do all that we're doing in safety one without thinking of the other end of the telescope, what's happening when things go right. And really thinking through what is it that produces good care. How do clinicians and other people adjust? Because we've made little progress, little demonstrable progress. Now we've just done a review just to demonstrate that. You know how many papers there are in PubMed? Do you know how many papers there are in PubMed? Million. 23 million. Do you know, by the way, do you know how many systematic reviews are produced every day? Notice the unit of analysis. Every day. 11. Do you know how many randomized trials are published every day? 75. These are actual data. Send me an email and I'll send you the source. Evidence-based medicine is absolutely massive. Do you, know many how, do you know how many what I would call really good studies uh, where people have, at the, at the systems level, Instead of just producing policy or saying you've got to do root cause analysis or whatever else that they've said people have to do in safety one, where they've said what we're going to do is do an intervention in the health system properly designed to take baseline measures. That's my problem with IHI and health jurisdictions and health ministries across the world. They never take baseline measures. So they even do, don't, they're in safety one, but they don't even do good safety one. Okay? Take baseline measures, treat that what they're going to do at the systems level as an intervention with maybe a control group, you can talk about cluster randomized trial or step wedge design or whatever you want to talk about, and then measure whether they made an impact, and then measure sustainably whether the impact actually continued. In other words, to get good value out of public money, health jurisdictions, the ministry or whoever it is in your country, 
Uh, we're over-governed. We've got lots of them, but you've got county councils, so you're over-governed too, probably. <laughs> so um, that, that they don't just issue policy and say, hey, you lot, here's a new policy. Here's a new way to do root cause analysis. Here's a hand hygiene. Get on with it without measuring at baseline or treating this as an intervention with measurability. So even doing safety one right isn't done very well. Okay? I would settle for that in the interim while we work out how to make safety two work. So we had a look at those 23 million papers. We had a look at the 75 randomized trials done every day and the 11 systematic reviews every day and looked for, at the systems level, good examples of studies where people have done just that. IHI and most health ministries across the world do not do that. They just issue the next thing or come up with the bright idea and package it up and sell it to people. How many studies do you think we found with the characteristics I've just described? Six. <laughs> now, six over... I'm not that good mathematically because we've got statisticians that do my stuff. Six over 23 million seems a small proportion. We're just publishing a paper. It's on a revise and resubmit, and it'll be in, uh, in press, we hope, soon, saying that. Now, I've discounted Pronovost Central Line Infection Study because that's in a niche area. It's not a systems-wide thing. It's in intensive care units. And I've discounted Safe Surgical and Safe Lives because that's in operating theatres. I'm talking about changes at the systems level. Usually they hand hygiene and those sort of studies across the whole system or medical emergency teams across the whole health system in multiple hospitals. So that's, that's the volume of... That's, that's the standard of Safety One studies at this point. Really interesting, isn't it? So even safety one, I contend to you, isn't being done very well. So, so we need to develop more systems resilience. Crazy uh, for an audience like this not to be fellow traveller with me and get that and understand it and agree with me. So it's really, you're a very easy audience. <laughs> so I've got stuff on resilience and the different ways that people have construed it. Lots of people have a common view of resilience, a normal view, which is it's the capacity of an individual to bounce back in adversity. But we know it much more in terms of adjusting and uh, enabling people to continue to provide good care under all sorts of uh, changeable circumstances. And that's lots of that is in resilience engineering, in Richard's writing, in the, uh, in the books that we're publishing. So it's the sort of RHC kind of view, which is the intrinsic ability of a system to adjust and uh, continue functioning under all sorts of circumstances, good and bad. Um, the other things that I'm very attracted to in the resilience mode is um, the idea of workers imagined and workers enacted. WAI, WAB sort of stuff. You know, look, it's true that the policymakers and the managers, I don't want to disparage them because they're, they're trying to do good work and it's easy to disparage the managers and the policymakers. However, when they issue policies and when they design things for other people to take up at the clinical coalface, they really often don't have a good view of the way work is done at the coalface and don't do adequate involving of people at the coalface to say, will this work? Um, so, so we tend to figure out solutions and fix work as imagined rather than work as actually done at the coalface. And I think that's a powerful idea we have in safety too at our disposal. It's very hard to refute that. Um, the other thing is first story, second story, I think is very powerful, where people tell the first story and they use linear thinking to tell it. So, you know, things have gone wrong, find out what happened, attribute actions to people, uncover the root causes, fix the system. That's the way we've mostly done things. And, you know, we haven't made anything like the progress that we'd like to have made. But if healthcare really is like that, then that sort of linear logic doesn't make sense. It, it just, it just, it, it's, 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 it's the wrong solution set or, or logic because the system isn't available to that sort of logic. So instead, complexity th thinking is in the mode of second story. It's more complex. It's not linear. There are multiple interacting variables. We have to uncover how, many, how come we did this many times previously and things went right? Now, how did that work? That's a very powerful question. I've actually challenged a few ministers in different countries and, and, and health jurisdictions, policymakers, that I would really love it if somebody announced an inquiry in those countries that have lots of inquiries, UK and Australia have lots of them, whenever things go wrong. I'd really like a minister to announce, we're going to have an inquiry and we're going to try and uncover why things go right so often. And we're going to, this is a catastrophe sort of question. Things haven't gone wrong, 
we don't have a big catastrophe, but we, we're going to treat it as if there's a catastrophe happened, and we want to really thoroughly investigate why things have gone right so often. That'd be very interesting. Nobody's ever done that. I'm a failure. I've suggested that to a number of health jurisdictions in different parts of the world, and I'm the failure that you see before you today. So I've got other slides, but I don't want to sort of go on them because I'd rather have a discussion with you. How does complexity fit in? Let me just finish with that. Well, I wrote a paper with some colleagues, with um, really their sort of safety one people more than anything. Bill Runciman, who you might know, who's a colleague of uh, Richard's, uh, an anaesthetist. So we wrote this paper trying to look at the natural properties of complex systems. Wrote it in BMJ Quality and Safety. Just trying to tease out what was the nature of complexity. And really, I've given most of the characteristics. But we had a look at some interesting features. Because there's lots of people working on complexity, not just us in healthcare. And that was a point I was raising before. Lots of researchers have identified the common network and interactive complexity sort of features um, in all sorts of different disciplines like mathematics, sociology, marketing science, psychology. And I think we need to understand the features of a complex adaptive system to understand resilience. That's my particular interest. So you get all sorts of studies outside of healthcare which you can read for interesting insights. For example, the way boards of directors run. Those are networks. And boards of directors in Sweden and in Australia, they nominate each other to the next board. And it becomes a club. I'm sorry, I'm sure Sweden doesn't work that way. What am I thinking? <laughs> what am I thinking? <laughs> that, that, you know, boards of directors of the 20 most... Uh, most profitable companies in Sweden would nominate each other to the board and actually behave like a network. Mm. Uh, that's only Australia I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, b people who cite each other in the literature, academics. Mm. It's a network. It's a club. It's a worldwide club, especially in science. Not so much in resilience. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't all publish a book together and then cite each other in those books, would we? So that's another network. That's another network. And here's a forensic laboratory in Ireland where the people cluster together and work together. Executive management, yellow management, and so on and so forth. They're networks. They're networks within complex adaptive systems. And so we teased out some of the natural properties of complex adaptive systems based on this network theory type studies that we're doing. Networks are natural. There's hubs and behavior that's scale-free, i.e. it gets replicated at different parts of the system. There's natural pathways for people to work through, not clinical guidelines, prescriptions, but natural ways that people find to work together. There's natural appeal for some ideas, and some ideas are sticky, and those are the practices that are currently practiced. Those are the things people currently do. And there's a lot of stuff in the literature that never gets taken up. For some reason, they don't appeal. It, they, those, those, those practices aren't sticky. There's natural propagation and uh, flow through in systems of various ideas that have currency. And sometimes there's tipping points and things tip over into everybody's now doing this. Uh, Non-invasive surgery, for example. It didn't exist 25 years ago, and all of a sudden everybody was doing this in all sorts of uh, different ways. So we looked at the natural characteristics of complex systems. And what we realized when we wrote this paper was there's two types of networks. There's type A networks, which are purposely designed, and somebody in the health system, in some position of power, actually says, this should be the network. We're going to put all you lot together in a cluster. But there's the one that are composed of the relationships amongst clinicians via their professional interests, their referrals, their supports, their friendships, their communications, and their advice. These are natural networks, not designed, mandated networks by somebody in authority. These are the ones that really make the system work. When people are put together for the purposes of a reorganization, and somebody says, hey, you lot, you're going to have to work together, and this is the structure that we've organized for you, they take years to bed down, if ever, and they often are resisted for decades. Whereas these ones, the way people choose to work together, are really in the center of the delivery system. So it's not like a hierarchy where there's a sort of cascading uh, sort of authority structure. It's about the way people choose to work together naturally, natural networks. 
That's actually the delivery system that we should be investigating. That's the key cornerstone of healthcare. Now, we don't tend to investigate those. We tend to look past them and take them for granted, and that's a mistake. Maybe all this I'm really saying is really, we need to understand the features of resilient healthcare, and we really need to understand the features of the complex adaptive system. Because we haven't really grappled with that. We've theorized about it in resilient healthcare quite a lot. Now we really need to do a suite of studies to understand that more. Because I'm at heart an empiricist, even though I'm a safety two guy. If you can square that circle and work out that paradox, because this is full of paradoxes. So I don't want to talk anymore. I've taken an hour, and this is the wrong end of the day, and I'm a morning person. <laughs> Plus, I'm jet lagged. <laughs> So I just want to pause and really throw that open for discussion. Um, but there's my thinking from 12,000 miles away. I wonder how much it concords with your thinking. I wonder how much we're uh, in the same frame. What are the important characteristics when things go right? How do you know what's sound? I mean, to me, not being an healthcare practitioner, I'm trying to understand the line of work. There's so much happening. Yeah. Taking notes and notes and notes. So I have to find ways in to see what's important. And that's, that, that's one of the challenges, I think, with safety. I mean, you have all this stuff going on. What's the important stuff? It's easier when something goes wrong because then you know what that stuff is doing. You know, some of the great research in the early, early eras in, in, in social science mm -hmm. have been the anthropological ethnographic researchers who just hung around figured out how the world worked according to the perspective of the people who they were observing. Got Finkel, uh, Goffman, uh, there's multitudes of them. Mm -hmm. And we don't really see that kind of ethnographic, how does the world work and how does the world work according to the... So I, I would do more studies like that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I suspect healthcare does have islands of resilience amongst a sea of variation. I just made that up. <laughs> I should... those places. Yeah. Uh, what about those islands of extra special... I think there's lots of resilience in healthcare, but extra special islands of resilience. Uh, I'd love to study some of that. And I think doing that ethnographically, deploying people with a social science sort of training um, for six months or a year, uh, could tell us some interesting things. I'd also like to do that cross-culturally. I'd like to do, I'd like to deploy people in different countries to do that, so that we wash out any effects of a particular country. Because we have health systems that probably look similar, but maybe have some, at the level of detail, difference. And that would be interesting to find out. I don't, know. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but no, it's the one I've got. I'm just wondering how you identify those islands. <laughs> well, you know, one of the important things is to involve everyone in Sweden. Like network analysis, social network analysis or actor network theory uh, are, are, um, are gateways. And I published a paper in the, I published a chapter in the next book trying to grapple with that, are quite, are quite useful in understanding the structure of relationships and the way people interact vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other. So for me, that, that's, a, that's a small contribution we're trying to make. And in the rest of the slides, I haven't sort of lectured on them all, uh, we give some sort of studies that we've done using social network analysis and uh, actor network theory to try and understand the networked characteristics, the relationships, if you like, of the comp complex adaptive system. So for me, that's part of the jigsaw puzzle. For me, that's an interesting question. And uh, I, I think we've, we've sort of discussed social network analysis here too as a of, of trying to map out system um, properties of complex adaptive systems. Uh, but I think that in order to understand uh, the behavior patterns of, of groups of clinicians, yeah. the habits of those, to say, to, 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 to use another language within that sort of fitness landscape of an ED or something else, yeah. then I think that uh, observational studies uh, do make sense. But I've been struggling with exactly the question about how to actually understand the systemic properties of the complex adaptive systems. Because then we are um, uh, sometimes forced to just look at system properties that we have, which are 
there, in very many cases, uh, quality indicators, measurements, economical data, and other things that are not really reflective of maybe the processes that are in place. What other, what, what, what other methods have you been we look at uh, a number. We've got, I've, got, I've got one PhD student who's looking at workarounds mm -hmm. in IT. Now, that's quite a useful galvanizing sort of... Some managers uh, disparage people doing workarounds. You know, that's wrong. You should, do this. you should do the policy or do the IT system the way it's intended. But actually, part of the adjustment of making things work are workarounds. So we've published a couple of papers. I'll send you copies if you like. We've reviewed the literature on workarounds to date and have someone doing a PhD. They've just finished their field work. So that's another way of sort of trying to understand how actual behavior on the ground occurs. Had somebody else who went into an emergency department, two different emergency departments, for six months and just did anthropological fly-on-the-wall type of research. We published a couple of papers on that. Just, again, trying to do what Richard suggested, which is some rapier studies, some, some, you know, not a broad sword, a big sort of, let's do a big study, but try and fill in the details of how the complex adaptive system works. Um, we also do some safety one stuff, some big, big scale studies. For example, we did a study looking at how much of the care delivered in Australia is appropriate. So 55% in the US, 57% in Australia. So maybe one characteristic of a complex adaptive system, this system we call the healthcare system, is that the amount of care which is delivered, which people call appropriate or recommended, is about half. Now that's an interesting proposition. So now we're looking at what's the characteristics of those settings or those conditions where more evidence-based care is being provided and what's the characteristics where less evidence-based care is being provided. So that's a safety one study, but we're looking at and interested in the safety two consequences of it. But it's also interesting because uh, if we define, um, you were talking before about that 90% of care goes right. Yeah. What is right then? Sure. Yeah. That feed into our thinking about what's the nature of this system? What does right mean? What does no error mean? Is there really? I mean, you know, that we. We're in the early stages of understanding the health system, despite the fact most of us trained in it <laughs> and, uh, and uh, think we know something about it. My, my professorship is in, I'm professor of health systems research. Some days I don't think I know anything about health systems. <laughs> yeah, because making work in home care, even if you provide or prescribe medications, you don't know if the patients take them. Yeah. So adherence to, to treatment could be... And, and the reasons why they don't take it, it's, it's really good reasons. They have reasons for not taking the medication. So, and what is value then, and, and what is right care? That's what we are studying because it could be value based in another way than the medical system thinking about it. You know, when I said, um, when I said, uh, sometimes you do a study like that, and it's an accidental finding that's the most interesting. So when the surveyors, the nursing surveyors, came back from the field and we started to crunch the data, we noticed that some settings, uh, regardless of condition, often had more compliance with the guidelines and more evidence-based care. And some settings had very little evidence-based care. So independently of that, we just asked the surveyors when they came back to brief us on the setting. And they said some very interesting things. Now, this wasn't what we studied, so we couldn't publish a paper on it. But uh, they said, it really did feel, this is anecdotal, it really did feel like those places were much more team-oriented and uh, much more organized and much more, if you like, collegial than the places that didn't. But that's totally anecdotal. Now, when we did it, some radio interviews, Bill Rutzman and I did some radio interviews, and it's somewhere on the, you know, on the internet, we mentioned that uh, to the uh, to the radio interviewer, who's quite a famous doctor who does uh, radio interviewing for our public broadcasting system in Australia, and that was the most interesting uh, finding of all. But we couldn't publish on that because it was just an accidental finding, and it wasn't it was anecdotal. So I suspect that that was further evidence for me that the resilient healthcare stuff's correct. We just haven't done the studies to really tease that out yet. 
So I'm very excited. It's an exciting time to be thinking about safety too and resilient healthcare. Uh, when someone points out the, 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 these body counts and says this is unacceptably high, how, and, and it's usually a politician's driven kind of question, how, how do you respond? What do you say when you encounter that? Yeah. So I would say a couple of things. I would say firstly, look, keep doing safety one stuff because you're not going to stop anyway. We're not going to stop anybody doing safety one. No, we're not what we want to. So keep, keep on trying to reduce error and getting that 333,000 down to 290,000 or whatever is your target. Uh, however, surely there's an argument to say, can we look at the other end of the telescope? Surely there's an argument to say, can we understand when things go right? One of the problems that we've got at the moment is when the body count goes up, as you say, to 333,000 or whatever the number is, I fear that we... we um, disenfranchise the clinicians who, if we intensify and redouble efforts, we're essentially blaming clinicians for the 333,000 or whatever the number is. And they, clinicians, rightly so, feel pulverised, they feel pummeled, and what's happened is many of them we've lost. They've run down rabbit holes saying, you just blame me. We're, I know we've talked about a non-blaming society, but mobilising numbers like that, what we end up doing is blaming people. And so I think we've lost many clinicians. If we had a positive message, and I'm by nature optimistic, so this appeals to me psychologically, if we had a positive message to say, we want to work with you clinicians, not just on the body count, but we know that you produce a lot of care that's good, and we really need to understand that so that we maybe can radiate that out. Maybe we can swamp some of the 10% with the good message. Safety 1 Safety 2, for me, they're two sides of, of, of an enterprise to try and improve things. And I would just emphasize safety too. But I think um, that it's very, uh, it's, a, it's, uh, it's easy to say, but it's very, very hard to do. And sometimes it feels like we have to change our minds of how to look. Because as you showed with this uh, Vasa, uh, the historical case, <laughs> and how, and we can go back. To the pyramids. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like the ones our mind or our <laughs> brains are, are organized to, to look are. at this linear. And how can we change, change that? That's not the easy thing. It's very easy to say that we should look at everything that goes right. And, and so because it's much more and so. But it's so, uh, even if, uh, like you talked about that, a lot of people in the healthcare say, you know, no, no, we don't have any brain culture anymore, and so on. So when you come to the uh, corner, it's still there. It's it is. something like in the very, very back of our brain or something like that. So we're not, I mean, yeah. we're evolved to be the people, the creatures we are, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Stralopithecus afarensis, 2.8 million years ago, Homo begins. Two million years ago, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. Now we've got Homo sapiens, wise human. I'm not so sure, you know, Homo sapiens. And, and we are hardwired, evolved to do the things we do. You know, if somebody invades our turf, we turf protect. If, uh, if, um, if uh, something goes wrong, we look for a scapegoat. Of course, all those things. We can't, we're not going to change evolved human nature. However, we're also thinking, cognitive, smart sort of uh, uh, species that uh, has the capability to understand. So I remain optimistic is all I can say. <laughs> Over time we might produce evidence more than we have rather than theories. This is not something that's going to be fixed on the turn of a dime. This is long-term work. This is long-term work. I said that my joke was we're not going to run out of work anytime soon. And it's, uh, as we start to say, it's all about money. It's very, very hard to get founders to establish the thing long, long time. Well, we, like, we've got 10.85 million. Yeah. So it's yeah. not impossible. No. We moved to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, let, don't let me fool you into thinking it's easy to get those sort of money. <laughs> you uh, 20, got them. Yeah, 20 years we've been working on this. There is so. no money left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's right. The other, other thing is, getting lots of money, big grants like that, it's not a, it's not a sudden solution. It's all money in and money out. It's money in, we get this money, we pay salaries for people to do more studies and uh, it gets spent. It's not like I'm rich. 
Mm -hmm. But in Sweden it's problem to get funding for, you know, patient safety and this type of research because mm -hmm. The funders think it's you know quality improvement. Yeah, yeah, that sure, sure. Be We've done something very. We've done something very specific though. We are bidding in the National Health and Medical Research Council, level one, category one money, and we're bidding in the same pool as the molecular biologists and the uh, cancer curers mm -hmm. and all those sort of people. And we've developed for ourselves. We did this deliberately. It took us ten years track records that just look like a medical researcher. We've published enormous amounts of stuff. Some of it's junk. Yeah. <laughs> okay, because they, they publish junk. Yeah. They salami slice their papers up yeah. and publish <laughs> 10 papers where we paper, publish one. Yeah. So we said we have to compete with those guys to get yeah. our share of money yeah. instead of them just saying we do it. So we did that care track study, the big study with $2 million looking at how much evidence-based care there was. Yeah. Not because that's our first love. Yeah but because we need to do big studies of the same caliber as the studies of other people. Mind you, I'm not saying we did, uh, that wasn't a bad study, and it's a very important study, but I'm saying we do stuff in a safety one frame, where the study is needed, where it contributes to the international literature, and then publish a lot of papers out of it, specifically because that's the enterprise that we have to be in to get our share of funding to do safety two work. So we took a specific track. And that wasn't easy. We've worked 90 hours a week, you know, same, the same as the gene splices, to, uh, to, to get to the stage where we get our share of the resources. But we've managed to achieve that. Uh, but it's incredibly difficult to do so. Yeah. And we've built, you know, we've built a, what looks like a biomedical group of 100 people. Uh, we, we've, 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 we've applied the biomedical model to our health systems research. Uh, so you are 100 people on every paper and you have 100 people? No, on not on every paper, but <laughs> you know, and I'm not on every paper. Mm -hmm. But still, we've got people who are publishing, like the biomedical people, 20, 30 papers a year. Mm -hmm. that's, it's because that's what we do. Yeah. We're a machine for turning research dollars into papers to get the next study done, to get the next set of papers published, to get the next set of PhD students in place, to get the next. Uh, it's an enterprise. a lot of PhD students who do their groundwork. Yeah, 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 exactly. And research assistants and all that sort of stuff. When we get as big as the Karolinska, we'll probably stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my target. <laughs> but we patient safety researchers at Karolinska Institute, we don't have any money at all, so... Yeah. No, but that's the problem. If we stay a cottage industry, what do they call a cottage industry? Yeah. And that's what we were. So we put those four centers, you know, when I started off with the four centers, they were each cottage industries. We put them together to create this uh, uh, critical mass. Yeah. We are also a small research group. We need to get bigger so we can produce more. Well, you have, there's two choices. You either have to do what Richard suggested, which is do small scale studies, lots of them, and build an evidence base yes. that way, or do our track, which is to say, let's put a number of people together who fit together, who can do research together and create an enterprise and then get much bigger grants and much bigger yeah. and be a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. The cost to do what we did, though, is absolutely significant you know, in, terms of the, in terms of the efforts that we've put in. I always say, you've seen me now. I was six foot ten when I started this. <laughs> Look at me now. Look at me now. It's ground me down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Thank you, Dr. Braithwaite. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much for your for your talk. Thank Appreciate you very much. much.